Nathan's a teen who recently announced his intention to drop out of school in part because he doesn't see any path to graduation due to excessive school absences and failed classes. School administrators say he's often found with friends who skip class to smoke weed. So he comes into me and says, I've just decided I'm not going to graduate. It's not worth it. I can't. I think it's impossible at this point. And the administrators hate me. Uh, and I start exploring with Nathan a little bit in this way. Safety. You know, how does he feel about his relationships? A good way to ask about safety, um, I really like this. I say on a scale of zero to 100, 100 is another person who knows you perfectly knows what it's like to be you, to live your life, the way you feel, the way you think, that's a hundred. Who knows you better than anyone else? And have them say, and then what score do they get? And kids whose, whose highest score is like 50, 55, maybe my friend at school is 60, I really worry about them. I think that's a safety issue, that they don't feel safe to open up and be vulnerable and to be known. So do they feel safe? Connection, how are relationships with, pe with peers, parents, administrators? Do they feel seen and cared for? Unconditional positive regard. And confidence, how do we convey confidence? So, so Nathan, unfortunately, was on the verge of dropping out. Um, he was labeled a troublemaker because he had skipped class, smoked a little weed, and wasn't very, didn't feel a great sense of safety. He didn't open up very easy. So I was, I was privileged to be the first person who got to hear through a stream of tears that he'd been going to school but sitting in his car in the parking lot for six hours because he couldn't bear to go in and then would drive home. Does that sound like a troublemaker? Sometimes taking a little extra time to really connect and make him feel safe to share. That's a, a big, burly teenage kid doesn't ever want to admit that. Um, Nathan was seen as being unmotivated, and I think this is, uh, I hope, a useful example that I give when I talk about motivation. People say, well, the traditional way of raising kids is rewards and consequences. This is very different. And um, what I see with rewards and consequences feels a little bit like a, a guy trying to learn how to hit a baseball. And he's, imagine, I like to imagine it's me because I have some humiliating moments in my life playing baseball. And um, imagine I'm trying to hit a baseball, and you're saying, you can do it. You can do it. Keep your eye on the ball. You're yelling all those things. Uh, um, where's Francis? He can help me remember the other things you yell um, that, to your kids when they're trying to hit a baseball. Um, so you can do it, you can do it, and you're trying to motivate me, and I swing and I miss, and I go, oh. And you say, okay, you just need a little more motivation. Let's bring in some more cheering. We'll bring in all your friends and family and everyone that you know, and they're watching you and cheering for you now, and I go, oh, gosh, I'm motivated, right? And then maybe dad stands up in the outfield with a $100 bill, and he says, if you can hit it this time, you get $100. And that's the reward. And then we could do a consequence. We could have someone standing behind you with maybe like a, like a baseball that's going to like throw it at your legs if you miss. And if you miss, you're going to get pelted with a ball in the leg. Right? That kid's standing there. Could he be any more motivated? But he might miss. Why? Because maybe he just can't hit a ball very good. And so we see this sometimes where our efforts to motivate kids with rewards, with consequences, to do better in school, to perform better, they go home having failed anyway, and then they feel even worse. I didn't get the, I didn't get the, the $100, and I got hit with the ball, and everybody watched me fail, and then they just want to dig their heels in and say, forget you. And that's the kid who looks unmotivated, who says, I'm just not going to try. You can't make me. That's a kid saving face who's trying to say, I just can't. I can't. So efforts to motivate can backfire. Remember this, translating motivation, which is a want, into performance, which is a result, requires an ability, a skill. So, so sometimes when kids are, are not performing, we, we say that they're unmotivated. And in, in the example I gave before, they actually are. They want to be good. They want certain things, but they just can't. Even self-motivation, the way that we think about it, is a skill. If you, if, you, if you don't want to do something, like come to this tonight, but you feel like you should, you have this remarkable ability to motivate yourself and to say, okay, I'll, just, I'll do this, I'll dedicate this much time, this is how I guess I'll make it fun, you know, I know that it'll take about this long, this is how I've done it before, I could bring somebody with me, one, two, three, go. And it's this remarkable cognitive thing that we can do to self-motivate. 
So when we talk about kids not being motivated, I would look really closely at their ability. What is it that they're struggling to do? Um, because motivation happens naturally. If their needs are met, they will self-actualize. Every time I say that, I know that's like a principle of faith, but I believe it.